This is Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're in Augustine's Confessions, Book 7, Lecture 1. And Book 7 is perhaps the pivotal book. We've been following Augustine through his education. and his doubt in this book he makes progress on two things one the nature of god two the problem of evil and really in a philosophy class those are the two issues so this is the book for a philosophy class He's continued to have problems in thinking of God as a material being. He can't imagine any being that isn't material, however small or great, right? The smaller you go, it doesn't mean you get to be not material. You're still material. You're just small. And then even then, small is perspectival, right? You're small to a human but it might be big to an ant small to an electron is big to a quark all of those things still take up space so how could he imagine god and not only that he comes to see he understands that god having existed from eternity is also unchangeable, but matter is in constant change. So just from that, he, he sees, well, God can't be material just for that reason, or else God would be changing. So he, he, he says, I can't conceive of anything that doesn't have space. If it doesn't have space, it seems like nothing, like it isn't real. But then he began to reflect, and incidentally, think about the, uh, there's an argument here that we could develop out of his more narrative style. What is eternal is unchanging. Matter is changing, therefore, matter is not eternal. And remember, eternal means without beginning. Matter might very well have no end, could be everlasting. That's not the, the question before us. The question before us is, has it existed from eternity? And as you do something similar with mind, he began to think about the nature of mind. Has mind existed from, or is mind uh, material? And this helps him. He realizes his own thoughts are not material. His mind is not material. God is not material by analogy. From his own mind to God. And this is what helps him come to see that not all is matter. It's a very big deal, very big jump. So in this, these couple of paragraphs that we have here from Augustine are two things. Not all is matter. And matter is not eternal. Argument to that effect. You can see how that overlaps. So this makes him reflect on the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere present, but not as in space. It's not as if God's over here or over there. 
or the more matter there is, the denser something is, the more God is in it. So like a piece of lead has lots of God, because that's really dense. But air is not dense, so there's less God. Well, that doesn't make sense. God's equally present everywhere. So God's not, again, reiterating, not a material thing or not materially present. And I remember one of my own uh, professors stumbling on this point, gave him as a story when he was young and his dad had taught him that God is omnipresent. And he picked something up on a table like a marker and said, so you're saying God's in this marker. And he thought that was a really clever point to make against his dad. And his dad left, but I interpret it as he left because he was disappointed in his son, not for kidding. His son took it as I just showed my dad. He should have understood, of course, it's not speaking materially. So the uh, ruminations here of Augustine lead him to that same thing. Now, one thing to note as we're going, these arguments he comes to were always there. His unbelief earlier in life had no excuse. He's, he's 30 now. He says he's leaving behind youth. He's become now mature. Entering adulthood. Are you okay with that, that age? Is, is that what they say about millennials? Like they, they take till 30? So I can say, yeah, I'm just following Augustine. You don't grow up when you're 18 or 22. You grow up when you're 30. So he's leaving behind youth. He's a man and he still doesn't know. But nothing he's considered just now has changed from when he was 16, is, has it? He could have always known that his thoughts aren't material, therefore God is not material. And this is important because later in, the, in book seven, he's going to be discussing why he needs redemption. And he needs redemption because of his unbelief for which he had no excuse. Now, he continues with thinking about the Manichees. Remember, they taught uh, there were two material substances, one good, one bad. So he reflects that if there was a bad material substance, it could do no harm to God. God being infinitely powerful. And not only that, God is incorruptible, right, unchangeable. And so this uh, evil substance can't change God. It's a kind of self-contradiction. You say, yeah, there's this incorruptible God and he's fighting evil, which can harm him. So then he sees that God is the creator of all things, the material world and the human soul. So why is there evil? Why is there evil then? What is evil? He sees that the Manichaean view can't be the true view. Evil is not stuff. And a lot of times you'll see that in movies, like evil is a kind of a black ooze that comes out of a portal to another dimension and it has tentacles that try to grab your foot and pull you in but your friend grabs your hand and evil is yanking on your ankle and your friend's yanking on your wrist and it's so tense and the audience is eating the popcorn. Uh, no, evil is not a stuff out of which uh, something's made. So where did it come from? Well, one answer he's been told 
is that evil is due to free will. So he knows there's an immediate sense that we realize our will is due to us alone. I am responsible for what I will or choose. Not one of you is responsible for what I choose. Whether I do it or I don't do it, I'm the cause of my own sin. But here's a problem. God made me. God created my nature. And in doing that, God would then know by creating, not know because he flipped ahead in the book and read the last chapter. He would know because he made you precisely what you're going to choose. And so why would God have made either uh, me who chooses evil or the devil who tempts me to choose evil, that doesn't help out at all. That doesn't solve the problem. So he goes back, think about his method here, returning to what he knows, a fixed point, that God is eternal and unchanging. So he knows that. So what is evil? Whatever can be, uh, say, a God alone is perfectly good as unchanging. And, and here's a little bit of a curiosity that comes up for him. If something can change, it is not as good as what cannot change. Now, sometimes people say that if... If something can change, it is evil, just in virtue of that, or it must change to be evil. So they'll say, yeah, they're just humans. They're changeable. Well, no, wait. You could have always changed towards what is good. You could have always improved. So it doesn't follow that because humans are temporal and finite, they have to will evil. And that's an attempt to take away responsibility and say, it's not my fault because I'm finite and changeable. But here's, here's what we come to. God, as creator, is the determiner of the nature of things. And the good for a thing is according to its nature. So what's good for a rabbit is according to the nature of a rabbit. And what is good for a human is according to the nature of a human. Evil is what is contrary to the nature of a thing. And so destroys it. Takes it out of existence. Existence or being is good. So he has from here an argument to show that evil is not eternal, has not existed from eternity. God alone has existed from eternity. God made the nature of things. God created the nature of things. Evil is when something corrupts this nature. Now he has a little aside for a minute. 
an aside back to fortune telling and astrology. And I, I sometimes think I, I need to make this understandable to the students, but I actually don't because there's something of a resurgence of astrology. It, it, it may, maybe, I don't know, 20 years, it might've been harder for my students to imagine how superstitious the Romans were, how deeply saturated and superstitious about everything, every decision, every understanding of what would happen and how it took a long, Europe in general had that. And then that's what the enlightenment cured them of, moving out of superstition, superstitious thought, which is a logical fallacy. If this, if I have a magical amulet, then I'll have, get money. I have a magical amulet and I got money. Therefore, the magical amulet caused me to get money. It's called the fallacy of post hoc or correlation, not causation. Uh, not even now, the amulet, there's no correlation between those two things at all. Right? Here's a book. Do you see any tigers in the room? No. Therefore, this book keeps away tigers. And the first response to the student is, Anderson, I'd like to buy your book. Well, of course, books don't, uh, the, the two things aren't correlated, or nor is there a cause, right? Between the two. So astrology is like that. I was born under this star when the planet uh, Mars was in the ascendancy and the moon was like this phase. Therefore, I was destined to what? And he has his friend, Nebridius, who says, this is basically like a lot. People tell the future and they're right sometimes and they're wrong sometimes. And they only remember when they're right. And they use that as proof. See? Now, what's the, and, and, and telling you that this, I don't mean to make this comment. You can go to like a leading newspaper, which prides itself on factual evidence. And there's going to be an astrology section, right? In this leading evidence fact-based newspaper. So it's still there. But here we have his argument against it. It's a lottery. It's, there's no actual predictions. And you can run a test if you want to. Uh, and he says they're liars. They, they, they take your money lie to you that they know the future. And when they're wrong, they explain it away. And he, he runs an experiment with two babies born at the exact moment with opposite lives. The stars said they both should have the same life because they're born under the same star, same planet, same moon, but they don't have, they have almost exactly opposite lives. It takes this detour into astrology, which, because, because this is, again, this is narrative format, not necessarily a systematic philosophy book. He's telling you what he's thinking about as he's going along. And, and astrology and fortune telling have been something he's curious about. Now, returns to the problem of evil, part 11. He says this, I thought anxiously whence was evil. Now, I think that's admirable. I, I don't bump into me students or persons who are actually anxious about that or have even given it much of a thought. Evil means whatever displeases me and I'm organizing my life to have the most pleasure and the least amount of discomfort. And that's as far as they've gone. But he's, he, he described himself as anxiously wondering. And there's a reward for him. By seeking, he's already had the reward, which is these arguments and he's going to have more arguments as reward. I, of course, that's my reward. I wanted a million dollars. Yeah, he comes to know the truth. 
The problem with truth is this. It isn't just that it's really expensive. Like you can't buy it with a million dollars. You actually can't buy it. You could pay for an education, which amounts to a certificate to get you a job and never have learned any true things. It's up to you if you learn true things or not. And you're gonna have to do what he does. You're gonna have to seek it anxiously. If you don't do that, your mind will be impervious to knowledge, even though you get a certificate that gets you a good job. So here he is as the example of a philosopher. Now the word anxious here means something a little different. For us, it's more like, that, that'd be more like a mental thing. And you wouldn't want to have anxiety. This is more like, it includes that, but it's more like, I need this, I don't have it, and I'm going to do whatever I can to get it. And without it, there's something wrong with my life. I need to know why there's evil. What happens to humans that they become evil? The free will is not enough. Because God created us and could have made us with a will that uh, chooses good. If you have a will that must choose evil, then it isn't your fault. And, and many people use that excuse. They excuse themselves this way by saying uh, humans are fallible or humans are finite. That's just human. Well, it's true humans are fallible, but it doesn't follow from that that they must make mistakes. You could be fallible, but choose the right thing. Same with being finite. Of course, humans are finite and temporal, but you can be finite and temporal and always make the right choice. So that's not an explanation. It's not an excuse. So why is there evil? He says his soul is in tumult. Why hadn't humans, as creatures of God, remained in his image and served him? the cause of it what's the explanation of it so he knows what is evil an act contrary to the nature of a thing he also knows this he gives an argument to show that the original creation was very good without evil god as creator determines the nature of things and in giving them being he creates them good evil entered in after the original creation how and why but but see how far he's come so right God alone is eternal. God is good and unchangeable. And God is good in the sense that God is a determiner of the nature of things. By making something what it is, God's determined what's good for it. An evil act is something that destroys the thing. 
the original creation was very good. No evil was in it at all. But now there is evil. Where did it come from? Free will is not a sufficient solution. It's part of the solution that you have a free will. Otherwise, you couldn't do moral evil. But it is not a sufficient answer. God could have made you with a free will, and you didn't choose it. So why is there evil? Then? And the argument to show that God is not material, God is immaterial, and God or a matter is not eternal. So he's just in this section so far done quite a bit of work. There's quite a bit of fruit, let's call it, payment for speaking ancient, anxiously. You can come to know things. So what is he demonstrating for us here? We can come to know things by using reason. Only God is eternal. God is spirit, not matter. Matter is not eternal. God is unchanging and good. The original creation was very good. Um, God, as creator, is the determiner of good and evil by determining the nature of a thing. Evil in that contrary to the nature of a thing, not, a, not an ooze that comes out of a portal to another dimension. That's quite a bit of progress in using philosophy by his uh, 30th year-ish. Now, next part in book seven, he's turning to the Neoplatonists. And we're gonna pick up there next time.